As some of you know, I'm really interested in hand stitching and all kinds of vintage fabrics and collages and oh, just running stitches and embroidery stitches and the history of all of that. And so one of my favorite artists is a, a woman by the name of Mandy Petulo. Mandy lives in northern England. I've taken classes from her at the Chateau du Mans in France and I had the privilege of going to her studio in Greencastle, Newcastle, Newcastle uh, in northern England and it was one of the highlights really of my whole life. I love this woman, I love her teaching style, I love her work and I was thrilled yesterday to get her latest book which is called Textiles Transformed. Her tagline is really thread and thrift. She uses old clothing and quilts and fragments of needlepoint and lots of other things that she gathers at flea markets and brocantes and shops and from her family and so forth and restyles them into collages. Everything from birds to houses to abstract designs. I actually own a couple of her pieces. This is one that I really love that is a combination of an old quilt and she's done a little bit of embroidery on it. And then when I was in her class, one of the many things that I've made actually from her class was a little pouch that I use for jewelry that's made of a collage of vintage fabrics that I purchased at one of the flea markets that we visited while at the Chateau du Mans in France. I love this. And this little project, how to make this, is actually in her latest book. So I really encourage you to check her out. Her name is Petulo with two T's and two L's. I always have to think about that. We also did an interview uh, about her in our So Confident issue, I've already forgotten, six. issue six of 2020, So Confident. And we did a whole interview. She answered questions. She was lovely to do that from afar. And Betsy, who interviewed her, uh, talked about her. Um, we have someone at the door here who's kind of interestingly lurking. <laughs> we always have surprises when we have these little Facebook lives. At any rate, um, she, she, Betsy interviewed her, and she answered questions about her inspirations, her, her methods, uh, her background, and it was a wonderful interview and fabulous pictures of her work. And then I included some of the pictures that I had taken when I was in her studio and also some of the work that I had done as a result of learning from her. So that is something that we put in every one of our So Confident issues in 2020 is featuring an artist or a company or some interesting process, and Bessie does a fabulous job of, of identifying and, and finding some, some really interesting uh, people to talk about. So check that out. If you're a So Confident member already, you have it. If you're not, you can get it. Uh, so, so confident. But today we're gonna talk about French terry. It's a fabric that I have really learned to love to sew. French terry is actually identified by the fact that it has loops on one or both sides. Terry cloth, I'll put it that way. Terry cloth is identified by having loops on one or both sides. But we think of French terry as only having loops on one side. So the fabric is smooth on one side. I know you're not going to be able to pick up the texture particularly on the screen, but one side of the fabric is smooth, like a jersey, so you see the vertical ribs, the small vertical ribs, and the other side has horizontal loops. Think of terry cloth, think of a Turkish towel, think of robes and beachwear and that sort of thing, but now these fabrics have come into the fashion scene and you're seeing them for tops and bottoms and streetwear and all kinds of things. It's a super comfortable fabric to wear. The French terries that we carry consist of rayon of bamboo. As you know, rayon is a hybrid fabric. It's both um, a natural fiber and usually with some wool, wood pulp, and in this case, bamboo, combined with some sort of a synthetic. 
And then there's cotton in this and spandex. Wonderful drape. And one of the things about the rayon of bamboo is that it's super, super soft and absorbent. So it's also, um, it's warm and lovely to wear. So I want to show you some garments that we've made in French terry. I'm going to start over here with the Marceau tee. That's our latest pattern. I have it on too. I have it on in, of course, this uh, sort of gray, blue-gray tone and this deep rust. Here it is in a burgundy with the mm, off pinkish blush color. Not blush. What would you call that color? What do you call that color, Erin? Reminds me of mauve, 80s mauve. 80s mauve. <laughs> All right. Well, that's right. I used to have an interior in 80s mauve. <laughs> That's right. I've, I've gotten rid of that, but we're wearing it again, apparently. Uh, but look at what we did uh, for the cuff. A little bit of a contrast for the cuff. This is, this is not a French terry, but it is a knit, and it is a houndstooth knit, and it's something I've never seen before, really, in a knit, but a great black and gray with this uh, little bit of fuchsia in it, and it just gives that a little bit of a kick. The Marceau has this wonderful two-piece sleeve, so it has an under sleeve and an upper sleeve, and the upper sleeve has these deep pleats in it. And I think, I was just talking to Linda Wardlow, who's here today, and she was saying that that's her favorite part of the Marceau tee, is the, the pleated and uh, slightly full sleeve. And of course, the pieces, the right and the left fronts, have been shifted so that the right front is a little bit higher, and the left front is lower, both in the back and the front. Now this is the Helix T, which we don't talk about very often for some reason. I don't know why, because it's one of my favorite t-shirts. And it's called the Helix because of the way it is seamed. It's really a swirl, a spiral. And so these, this seam, which is on the front, also comes around and becomes the sleeve seam in the back and vice versa, the back seam comes around and becomes the sleeve seam in the front. This is a wonderful little heathered off-white French terry, and I've used a black and white or a gray and white stripe for the neck binding and to insert in these seams, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Erin made the new Chesney pants. Now the Chesney pant is one of the patterns that you get as part of So Confident 2020. So issue eight was the issue that featured these pants in French Terry. And I love the way she's added this little bit of edge stitching for a front pleat. And then because the fabric is a knit and because it's a jersey, that means it curls to the right side. So she did not finish the bottom of the pants. They are raw edged and allowed to curl. And she left the front a little bit shorter than the back. So I think this is really a, a fantastic detail. But it does make this very upscale athleisure ensemble, both in the same French terry. We've talked about the West End top a lot, it seems, lately. But again, it's the perfect pattern for the French terry, this fantastic uh, limey green. My friend Ann Nutting in Stockton, California, just emailed me last night a photo of her West End where she deleted the zipper and made this a seam down the center front. And so it's a pullover, and I thought it was brilliant. So think about that. I think I might have to make that. But she's going to be sending me a photo of herself in it. And we'll see that soon posted on social media, Instagram, and, and Facebook. But has a hood. So you see the texture of the French terry a bit on the inside of the garment. I could have used the contrasting wrong side of the French terry for the band, because you can really use either side. Even though the smooth side is technically the right side of French terry, you can use either side. And many times I've actually combined the right side and the wrong side, and it gives a little bit of a texture tonal difference, which is nice. Another piece that we rarely talk about, and I don't know why, this is a really old pattern that we brought back again because we like it so much. This is the Fuji Mountain Top. And this is just 
on a day like today, which is dreary here in Kansas and it's very cold. In fact, we're all shivering because our heater decided not to work today. Uh, so we're a little bit on the nippy side. But nevertheless, this is the perfect garment coming into fall to wear at home or out and about. It has a, a unique construction to it, which I don't need to particularly get into it at the moment, but the way we do this placket and it reverses uh, coming out through this cowl is really interesting. This is a little bit off center. A little bit oversized, nice seaming of the sleeve in the center back of the sleeve. So there are some things about this that make it unique and, and more fun to make than just an ordinary top. Erin, again, you can tell she's into these uh, knit pants. So she took the Hudson pants, which normally have the pleats, or excuse me, darts at the bottom, and these have the darts, but she's added the band as if it were a cuff on a sleeve. And she's also added the inset as a double inset applied stripe down the side. She also added the yoke in the front. I think it's the front. Planer on the back and then the contrasting yoke on the front. So both of these pieces, the Hudson pants and the Fuji Mountain top, make a great ensemble. All right, let's talk about how to sew French terry. I think this fabric is really easy to sew. I know there are people who are <clears throat> intimidated by knits still. I was too for a long, long time. And I realize now that I can tell that I sew a lot more knits because I use cotton thread for all wovens and polyester thread for knits. Well, for the longest time, I didn't have any polyester thread in my stash at home. And now I have cases and cases of polyester thread and even a little bit less of cotton thread. So it tells me I'm sewing a lot more knits. I think you just have to take the plunge. But if you're gonna take the plunge, try something like French terry rather than a super tissue knit or something super novelty or open weaved or lacy or whatever because a French terry is pretty darn easy to sew. Because it's a knit it doesn't ravel but the edges are not exactly beautiful either. You get a little bit of a fraying on the edge that I don't think is super attractive. It's not going to ravel out but it does have a look that is not particularly finished. So when I'm sewing the seam, I'm going to sew the seam using the polyester thread at the 5 8 inch seam allowance. And then I'm usually going to use a three thread stitch formation on my serger. And again, I'm using isocord thread. I know I sound like I'm repeating myself all the time, but I do get questions, emails from you all about what thread is that. And isocord is an embroidery thread that you can buy at most Bernina dealers. And it comes in 400 and some 420 col colors or something like that. And by the time you buy three or four spools at a time, various times, you get a collection and it lasts a long time because there's 1,400 or so yards on a spool. It's really fantastic thread. I did have someone email me saying that they walked into their Bernina dealer, told them they were going to use isocord for surging, and the dealer said, you can't do that. It's for embroidery. But trust me, you can. It really is very nice. It has a little bit of a sheen to it. It's fairly thin, so you're not going to get a big lump. And particularly on fabrics like this that are already lofty, you don't want to have a lumpy seam. So this uh, isocord thread really helps reduce that lump. And when you're pressing a seam to one side, you want to reduce that as much as possible. And the isocord does that. So that's my seam finish of preference. Although when I was making the helix top, I did not finish the seams. I decided to leave them raw because I wanted to press those seams open. I did serge the edge of the hem finish and other parts of it. I could have done a three thread stitch formation on each edge and still pressed it open, but I decided not to and I left it open and it's, or excuse me, left it unfinished and it works just fine. So polyester thread, a walking foot or even feed feature for sure. Because there is that loft and they're so soft, 
you're really going to get some movement in the top layer of fabric if you don't have a walking foot that allows you to feed both layers through evenly. So even if you don't have a walking foot as part of your ensemble of presser feet, I suggest that you buy one. They are pretty expensive, but it's absolutely worth it. And as a matter of fact, the even feed feature on my sewing machine is engaged all the time now. It's funny how I sewed for 60 years without ever knowing about a walking foot and got along just fine. But for some reason, now I can't sew without it. And I think a lot of people agree with that. If your particular brand of sewing machine does not come with a walking foot, you can buy a generic one that will fit most machines. So check that out. Walking foot, the three thread serge finish, and then you have some choices about finishing the seams. As I said in the Helix, I did produce a three thread serge for the edge and then I simply turned it using my Fusy Web. I always glue my fabrics down in knits first using one strip of Fusy Web, pinning it, steaming it, removing the paper, and then gluing the hem down. That'll keep, bet between the Fusy Web and the um, walking foot, it'll keep your hem from bubbling or rippling. I really can't sew without it anymore, particularly on a horizontal hem, which is the stretchiest part of your knit. That brings up another little discussion I had with a friend of mine, Kathy uh, Miller from Hudson, Wisconsin yesterday, who was saying she was getting ready to uh, cut a knit out, a fleece actually, that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And somewhere along the line, someone in her sewing club had said, you want to cut that out on the crosswise, meaning lay the fabric perpendicular to the selvage. And I said, well, really, I'm not sure exactly what your fabric's all about, but if it's a fleece that we sold you, the stretch, the most stretch is on the horizontal. And you always want to have the most stretch going around your body. So I doubt that you're going to actually cut that out on the cross grain. And of course, she looked at the fabric and agreed that that was right. And that was misinformation. So just remember, only one time have I ever seen a knit with the stretch at the lengthwise. And I remember uh, we have a garment here that stretches in the wrong way and you can't move. But it's, it uh, stretches nicely in the vertical, but you can't move your arms. So just think about that, which way the stretch is on your fabric, and you want to make sure that goes around your body. So this one I just stitched with a straight stitch. On this particular marceau, again, the top stitching for the hems is a straight stitch, and this extra edge stitching around the binding is a single line of straight stitching. But on this one, I used my cover stitch machine, both the hems and for the detail around the neck. It's super easy to do the cover stitching. If you're, if you're intimidated by cover stitching, but you have that ability, this is a good garment to practice on because, and particularly at a neckline, because these necklines are, are finished separately. So you finish the right side with the binding and the stitching, then you finish the left side with the binding and the stitching, and then you sew them together. So you're not having to sew a neck in the round, which is the hardest thing to do. So if you want to experiment with your cover stitch, get it out of the box. I know they're in the boxes. Get it out and try it on the Marceau T. Then you don't have to worry about the sewing in the round thing. So cover stitching versus edge stitching, it depends on your preference. It depends on what kind of equipment you have. But if you're out there buying ready to wear and you're buying t-shirts and tops and knit garments and so forth, you're gonna see cover stitching. And I think that that is the piece of equipment to add to your um, assortment of equipment. I would rather see you buy, add a cover stitching ability to your repertoire than even upgrade your sewing machine actually. And then there's that whole discussion about whether you buy a separate cover stitch machine or a cover stitch and uh, overlock combination. I have both. I actually prefer a dedicated cover stitch machine. Uh, I like not to have to change back and forth, although I realized last night, I was making this last night actually, that I could plan this so that I could do all of my stitching on the sewing machine, 
and all my overlocking on my machine and then save all of the cover stitching for the end. So that worked, but you do have to think about it and it might be in a different order than the guide sheet is actually telling you. So there's some thought that goes into it, but either way, cover stitching is to me the, the latest and greatest thing that the garment sewers have come upon. One of the things I noticed when I was uh, working with this uh, French Terry is that if I pressed too hard or uh, for too long, I could get the impression of the iron on it. So you want to always be careful with your pressing. You want to use a lot of steam and actually I can steam it and do a lot of hand pressing so the iron is not touching the fabric for very long, but you want to use a press cloth and we use organza press cloths here, which we sell. But if you have some silk organza in your stash, get it out, cut a piece and start using it. I really like to be able to see through it and yet it's enough protection that you don't get the marks from the iron. So let's talk about this little detail that's on the helix, this insertion. You know, if you've followed me for enough uh, many times, you know that I talk about sample making. So I made about three samples. I meant to bring them today and forgot. I made about three samples of what that was going to look like. I tried two or three different kinds of stripes and knits. I tried solid black. I had a, a narrow little stripe. I had the wider stripe. My first sample was cutting a strip and folding it in half so it would have a folded edge at one edge and I inserted that and by the time I had four layers of fabric, two of French terry and two of knit, it was just too thick. So this particular knit does not ravel, it has a nice clean edge to it. So I was able to cut a strip as a single layer. So I cut this I calculated it so that I would have a 5 8 inch seam allowance and then I wanted 3 8 of an inch to show. So that is an inch, I think. I believe it is. Okay. <laughs> so then I got my piece of fusy web and I cut it in half. And I applied the half wide strip of fusy web to the fabric first, removed the paper, and then I was able to fuse that into the seam allowance. Now people always ask me if it washes out. And the fact is that I've never actually removed it and torn a garment apart to see if it goes away. So it probably does, but in my opinion, it doesn't really matter because this particular product that we use, Fusy Web, is so sheer. It doesn't change the character of the fabric. It still <clears throat> remains pliable and sheer and it's perfect. So that's not something you need to worry about. So this is fused down first and then I, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and then I machine based five eighths of an inch from the edge. But I'm really more interested in keeping this three eighths of an inch even. So this is the edge that I follow and set my needle if I have to, to a certain position so that this is 3 eighths of an inch from the raw edge to the stitch line. And then hopefully I've cut it well and all is 5 eighths of an inch to the right side, but it might not be. But this is machine basted. So then you can see the machine basting on the other side. I'm gonna let this drop. There we go. Okay, so you can see the machine basting. So when I put the other piece with the right sides together, I'm sandwiching the uh, flat binding in, uh, in between, and I'm gonna stitch on the side where I can see the stitching. So I'm not sewing blind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stitch it just barely to the left-hand side of that basting line so that after I'm done, I can give that a little steam press and my flat piping is perfect. I did have a little issue. I was wondering about this as this was changing directions coming from the back to the front or the front to the back. It wanted to flip a little bit 
So I just did a little bit of stitch in the ditch right at the side seam and that now holds that so it stays in one direction. But even if it were to flip to the other side, it wouldn't be the worst thing that ever happened to me. So I really like that. I think it really highlights the features of this helix top, which is quite unique. So let's look at some of the colors that we have. We have, I lost count. I think we have like 15 colors of French terry. We have a lot of colors, including the two colors that I have on, the two colors of this Marceau T, the 80s colors. But we have black, and of course black will go with anything if you like the idea of combining it. There's nothing wrong with making this in one solid color, by the way. So everybody needs a black top. But I like the idea of the red and the black. I really like the idea of a taupe and black for something more neutral. Seeing this piece reminds me that just because it's a knit doesn't mean it doesn't wrinkle. Knits can wrinkle. The only knits that don't wrinkle are polyester knits and ITY knits. Those, those are the knits that you like to travel with because you can wad them up in your suitcase. But rayon and cotton and linen and wool knits, they wrinkle. It, they steam out beautifully and if you keep them hanging on a hanger or store them nicely then it's not going to be a problem. This one has obviously been on a bolt and gotten a little bit wrinkled. I even like the taupe and the purple. So those four are great combinations. I think this red and purple would be fun for something kind of bright. And of course the black goes with all of them. Then we have a couple of greens, and I even like this sort of strange combination of the two greens, this more mint color and the more avocado. Now that's a very unusual color combination, but I think it's pretty cool and pretty interesting. But again, this could be combined with any of these, with the black or the taupe or all-in-one fabric as well. Now last week at So Kansas, um, Rhonda was here from Houston, and she used a print on one side, a printed knit, and a solid on the other, and that was fantastic. So you can mix it up if you want to. We actually have two sort of lime greens. We have this one, and then we have one that has a little more yellow to it. But I love this combination of blue and the green or yellow. That's a great combination. This would be great with taupe black, burgundy. The combinations are pretty endless actually. And then these two colors are quite beautiful, I think. And again, this seems to be a color combination that is really showing up in ready to wear in the advertisings that I see from all the great stores. This beautiful uh, mocha brown and this peach tone great combinations. So check out all of our combinations on the website. So I think that's it. Do we have any questions? I do. I'm very curious about your top and your pants. Ah, my pants. Well, the top is the Marceau T, obviously, with the, uh, the combination of two French Terries. And I'm wearing jeans uh, today. Um, I had on five pairs of pants today with this top this morning and settled on jeans. Uh, when I go to Arkansas, which I do frequently, to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, there's a little store down there that carries jeans. And it's where I buy my jeans. Uh, either there's a brand called FDI. And they're kind of knockoffs of Not Your Daughter's Jeans. And they fit me really well. This has embroidery, kind of a cross stitch kind of embroidery on the, as decoration, and I like those a lot. Do you remember the color of uh, French terries that you have on? Do I remember the color of the French terry that I have on? No, but we can probably find out. Betsy, yeah. can you help me a second? <laughs> can you check out what we're calling these two colors of French terry so that I can tell them? All right, great. We'll be back <laughs> with that.
Okay. Um, do you use the uh, th on all three threads for the surging? Do you use isocord on all three? Uh, yes. On all th on my three thread surging, I use the isocord thread in both loopers and the needle. So I use the same thread. That's that's a choice I always do actually. No matter whether I'm using isocord or three threads three spools of the polyester thread, which I do sometimes. If I don't have the isocord thread that I want, then I'm going to use three spools of the same thread that I've sewn the seams with. But they're always the same. I don't mix my threads. I don't mix colors. Well, sometimes. But I, and I don't miss, mix types. Yes, what are these colors? Uh, rust and shadow. Okay, so this is called, this, these uh, French terries are rust and shadow. This, I realized when I was pairing this this morning, this has a lot of blue in it at, for a, a gray. And so I tried putting them with my charcoal pants and they were just a little off. And then I put them with blue jeans, which was great. I need to figure this out a little bit, but I love this shadow blue, it's, or shadow gray, shadow blue gray. <laughs> okay, um, when straight stitching on knits, do you use a regular straight stitch or a little tiny zigzag? When stitching on knits, straight stitching on knits, I always use a straight stitch, a 2.4 to 2.5 stitch length. I never use the little zigzag stitch. That's a common uh, theory that is thrown out there. And certainly I have proposed that as well when I talk about it in my sewing knits book. Um, I give that as an option. But I, I don't really like it. And the reason I don't like it is when you're sewing on solid color knits like this, when you open that seam or press it to one side, you can see the little dimples of a zigzag stitch, which I don't care for. And I, the one stitch I do not use is the pre-programmed zigzag knit stitch that comes with a lot of sewing machines. That stitch should never have been invented in my opinion. That is too much thread in the seam. It's impossible to rip out, and I'm ripping all the time. You know, my, I have more rippers in my sewing room than I do pins, practically, uh, because I'm always ripping out. And so forget that stitch. If you feel like you need some additional vertical stretch, that is an option. But I would use it sparingly, and I would use it mostly on textured things, lacy things, maybe a print, but really not on a solid knit. Okay, uh, which uh, cover stitch machine would you recommend? Which cover stitch machine do I recommend? <clears throat> well, I own three. I have a combination baby lock machine that does a beautiful cover stitch machine. It's an ovation. I know they have another top of the line one now. That machine, as expensive as it was, has become a cover stitch only machine. It's set up all the time. I use a Bernina overlock machine that I'm crazy about. I also have a Bernina standalone dedicated cover stitch machine, but I, I'm under the understanding that they don't produce that machine anymore. I have on pre order from my dealer, though, the new Bernina cover stitch combo machine. So I can't talk about it yet in terms of its performance, but I'm expecting it to be top of the line. But I also have a Janome uh, cover stitch machine, dedicated cover stitch machine that I like very much. That's easy to thread. The stitch is fine. It was quite inexpensive in relationship to others. I really think that when you're investigating buying a cover stitch machine, you need to go to more than one dealer if you have one in your town and actually take your samples of fabrics, your knit fabrics, your woven fabrics, and sit down and have and demonstrate and operate it yourself on your, your samples. Don't just sit there and use their samples, which always look good. And then when you're buying a machine, you're, you're buying into a dealership as well. So you want to have a relationship with a dealership. You want to have education from a dealership. You want help. You want good um, maintenance. Uh, so you're buying more than just a machine, you're buying a relationship. And I find that Bernina dealers are always great. We happen to have one around here, so I'm not familiar with other dealers in my area. But um, where, whatever dealer you have that you have established a relationship, go see them and sit down and talk about the options. Um, would the French Terry be good in a Berwick Street? 
Would the French terry be good in the Berwick Street? You know what? That would be really interesting, and I think that would be fun. It's drapey enough. You think it's oh, absolutely, it's drapey enough. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know where you're coming with that, though. It is a little bit thick, and the Berwick Street tunic has some pleating across the front. One thing you might think about doing on those pleats is making the pleats deeper than the little three quarter inch pleats that they are, or eliminating them altogether. Mm -hmm. I'd have to I'd have to make a sample <laughs> to see how much it poofed out. Um, I would love to use the French terry for a Bristol, um, but how can you grade it down? The extra small is not small enough. Okay, well, first of all, Aaron, come around here. Oh. <laughs> um, so Aaron has on the Bristol top today. This is not the cutest thing. So this has some applique on it. Uh, this was a knit fabric in a print that we cut up into this odd shape and hand stitched on. It could be machine stitched on. Um, tell me again which issue this was. Uh, this was in so series, confident, series six. six. So confident mm -hmm. series six. If you have that, you have the how to do this. But this is really cute. This is not a French terry. This is just a, a regular sort of novelty knit. But it, it is, does have this, the thickness and kind of the heft of a French terry. Mm -hmm. But in terms of grading down, that is um, probably not very easy for me to answer via Facebook Live, but our patterns are multi-size, so you see the grades of all the sizes. So you know that there's, let's say, a quarter of an inch difference between each size. So to go down one size from the extra small, you might follow the previous grades from all the other sizes and simply go down one more of that dimension. That's about all I can tell you now. Uh, this has two seams in the back. Uh, the yoke can easily be altered at the shoulder seam. It could be cut down, and the width could be cut down. I think um, if you want to email me, I might be able to help you a little bit more, but that's about all I can probably address on a Facebook Live. Can you show the taupe and the mocha brown together to see what the difference is? Taupe and mocha brown. Um, well, you were calling right that one. Oh, and a mocha brown. And, and this is that a taupe or is that gray? This one. Yes. All right. Here's the taupe. And I'm not that crazy about this. <laughs> well, I think maybe she wanted to know the differences to see which one she liked better. I mean, oh, okay. The, the mocha has looks has more. Texture. This has more pink, and this is a heather texture, mm -hmm. and this is solid. Yeah, okay. Um, can you help with a full bust adjustment on the helix? Can I help with a full bust adjustment on the helix? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is yes, but again, not on Facebook Live. Uh, this is trickier, for sure. I would have to address that at uh, on a, in another format. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on woolly nylon in the loopers? What's my opinion about woolly nylon in the loopers? Um, I've certainly used woolly nylon in loopers. Um, I think the primary reason to do that is for comfort. Uh, it's soft, but it's also a little bit lofty and it's not something I use routinely. I've used uh, woolly nylon when I've, tried, when I've made serger piping, when I want a lot of fill, because that's what it will do. It'll kind of fill in the spaces. But on, on regular seam finishes for regular knits, I don't see the need for that. Okay, um, would you, do you use the left or the right needle for the three thread surging? Do I use the left or the right needle for the three thread surging? I use the right. I'm always looking for the narrowest three thread surge line that I can get. Of course, there's some adjustment to be made uh, sometimes uh, with particular fabrics, although on the French Terries, I made no adjustments. It was like whatever was in my uh, adjustments on my Overlock machine worked just fine for the French Terries, uh, but I, sometimes I'm adjusting that width, but I rarely use that left needle for any kind of finishing. 
Um, occasionally, if I'm surging or overlocking maybe a velvet or something with a deep pile and it's falling off the three thread with the right needle is falling off the edge, I might have to go to the left needle. But 99% of the time, I'm in the right needle. Uh, there are a couple questions about my pants, um, which I'm actually just wearing. I, want, I don't know if it's the one I'm wearing, but I'm just wearing a, a dress with the bristol on top. So. so Aaron is wearing, so there were questions about Aaron's pants, but nice. these are your pants too. Well, true. That's, I'm not and exactly these are your sure pants. which, what they're talking about. So, so, um, um, whoops. So these are the Chesney pants that are a pattern with the So Confident 2020 that have an edge stitch that defines this, what would be normally a, a pleat line and the offset hem with the raw edges. And then the Helix pants, excuse me, Hudson pants, can't, can't talk here, Hudson pants that have darts coming out of this bottom uh, cuff and the wonderful stripe down the side and the additional yoke. So these are Hudson's and these are Chesney's. And do you remember the color on um, the Chesney and the Helix top? No. It's the only Heather I can find out. Betsy? <laughs> what color is this? I think that's cream spec. Cream spec. Cream, cream spec. I think you're right. Cream spec. Okay. Um, on the helix, um, was the pattern adjusted to make room for the insert? Was the pattern adjusted to make room for the insert? No. The seam allowance is 5 eighths of an inch. And so, I used the same seam allowance sewed it at 5 eighths of an inch and left 3 eighths of an inch exposed. But the, the, the sewing that has not changed. It just happens to have something in the seam allowance that's been sandwiched. Um, sh is there a shadow gray French terry? Um, that is another um, thing we'll have to look was up. This, did we call this shadow? I think you, yes. yes. Yes, this is the shadow gray French terry mm -hmm. that I have on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I think we're ready for pattern specials and okay. discounts. All right. So we have specials this week. Patterns. We have the Helix, the Hudson, the West Ends, the West End, and the Marceau on sale for $18. The Marceau and the Fuji Mountain top are digital download patterns and they're on sale. The Fuji is $12. That's a bargain. Mm. And the Marceau is $15. Also a bargain, but this is really a bargain. <laughs> and then we have two tutorials, sewing with knits and sewing fashion knits at $15 and all colors of all the French Terries are 20% off for the next week. There you go. Um, and we did have one comment that the shadow gray is not on the website, so we will look into that and oh, make sure it's The shadow there. gray is not on the website. We will make sure that it gets on the website today. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. All right, thanks so much. See you next week. <laughs>